Hello amigos, we just finished a day and a half visit to Carlsbad Caverns National Park in southern New Mexico and it was a great visit. I'd really recommend you come. It's an amazing place but it's very challenging to photograph and that's what we learned yesterday and we had to overcome all those challenges. Today we're able to be more targeted and be better prepared and in this video I want to show you some of the settings, how to prepare your equipment and how to prepare yourself and the resulting images that you can get from this amazing location. Follow me in a few seconds. Carlsbad National Park is 40 minutes outside the city of Carlsbad, New Mexico in southeastern New Mexico. And Carlsbad is a great location to use as a base. There are plenty of hotel options and dining options. The only thing to remember is because of the natural gas and oil industry in the area, prices for hotels can be on the high side, so don't be surprised. Carlsbad is five and a half hours from Albuquerque where I reside three hours from El Paso and only three and a half hours from White Sands National Park. So a great combination is to go to White Sands and then go to Carlsbad National Park or the other way around. So when is the best time to visit? In reality, you can go anytime. The caverns are 56 degrees Fahrenheit or 13 degrees Celsius year round. Any time of the year, the temperature is the same. Very nice and cool, but a little wet down there. The only thing to remember is if you go during the summer, it can be very hot outside. So if you're gonna go for hikes or walks or photograph in the desert, just to remember, please make sure you always have a lot of water and sun protection. Let's talk about the cavern. The main cavern, Carlsbad Cavern, is very large, and I'm gonna divide it here in two different areas. The first area is this one right here. This is the big room where most of the important attractions are. You can take an elevator down from the visitor center. The elevator is 758 feet down, so it's quite steep or 231 meters. And only takes a few seconds to get you there. Another option is you can take the walk through the natural entrance and walk down from the visitor center that walk is about one and a half miles or two and a half kilometers. It takes most visitors about 30 minutes to do that walk down. For us photographers, it takes a little longer. In our case, it took us almost two and a half hours. I recommend you plan for at least a day and a half during your visit at the caverns. First, go online to the park's website and make your reservation with plenty of time. Then show up at the visitor center right when they open. Get your tickets and be ready to take the natural entrance right at 8.30 in the morning when it opens. Take your time going down. We'll take you two, two and a half hours. Take photographs, get used to the cavern, get used to the structure and what you're gonna see. Experiment with your settings, dial in your exposures and be ready for when you get to the big room. Then spend three or four hours in the big room. There's gonna be plenty of options for you to photograph. At the end of the first day, take time once you get back to the hotel to review the images and decide what changes, what additional photos you would like to take the next morning. The second morning, take the elevator down and now concentrate in the big room. Go back to those structures you would like to photograph again. Perhaps this is the time to get your zoom lens and do the close-ups, or perhaps you want to use your tripod and do HDR, and you know, spend another three or four hours that second morning. That's how we did it, and it worked really well for us. Now, 
The natural entrance is a short walk from the visitor center. As you approach the natural entrance, and you can see the big hall here on the side of the mountain, you're going to go to the amphitheater. The amphitheater is the area where you, at sunset, you can come in, sit down, and look at the tens of thousands of bats that come out of the cave and they're going to go feed for the night. Now, you cannot photograph. His cameras are not allowed or electronic equipment of any type. So you have to be in silent and just looking at the bats coming out of the cave. In the morning, there are no bats. You just start making your way down, as I show in this image here on the right-hand side. Once you enter the cave, you're going to be on a very nice path. It winds its way down. It can be wet in a few areas, so just make sure you don't slip. You can also get some very nice images as you walk down. You're going to see all kinds of structures, patterns, and shapes in the ceiling and on the walls of the cavern as you're making your way down. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a great opportunity to practice and adjust your settings and trying to balance the natural illumination with what your camera is recording. Once the natural path ends, it ends right where the elevator is. And that's an area where you can have a snack. There is a snack bar available there. And once you enter the main cavern, you cannot take food of any kind. So just make sure you have water available with you. And here you see some images of experience of photographing in the main part of the cave. The cave opens up quite a bit and you're able to use your telephoto lens or your wide angle mid telephoto lens and trying to get images from structures that are at different distances from you. So let's go through a few examples of images that I was able to get from photographing the main part of the cave. All of these images were taken with flash except one and I'll tell you which one it is. So here we have this image. This one is the main part of the cave, is the big room. Look like there are a bunch of people sitting down for dinner and a chandelier, this is what the structure on top is called, hanging over them. This image was taken at 32 millimeters. I was able then to recompose, go to 105 millimeters, zoom in on the chandelier and get this other image. Nearby, there is this other structure. I like the composition of these two arms almost touching. And then I went to the back and got a, kind of a backlit version of it. You will also see many patterns on the walls of the cavern. Like here you have this other e image of some stalactites, interesting pattern hanging from the ceiling or this other one where you have deeper part of the caves with very interesting structures, a similar one on this other image. And here is the image that I was telling you, I didn't use the flash. This is actually an HDR image. And in a few minutes, I'll give you more information about this one. And here's this other one, a big piece of rock that looks like a monster's face. So many different type of patterns, shapes, the stalactites, the stalagmites that make so very interesting photography in the big room. So what do we need to bring? Well, first thing is, as I told you, the cavern is 56 degrees Fahrenheit, 13 Celsius. After being there for a while, it can feel a little cool, especially because it's humid. Make sure you bring a light jacket or a fleece with you. There are no or very few places to sit. So make sure you have comfortable shoes. The floor can be a little wet in area, so make sure you have shoes that give you good traction. Bring a headlamp or a small light. Now, the cavern has enough lighting. You're not going to have any issues walking around, but it's always good to have a small light, especially if you're going to be looking at your equipment or your gear to have a little light with you. Make sure you bring water. There's no places to drink water. You're allowed to have water with you and bring it inside the cavern, but you're not allowed to have any food. You're not going to have any food and you're going to have a long day. I highly recommend you get a very nice breakfast before you head to the cavern. Now let's talk about equipment. You need to get a camera that does well in very dark or low light situations. Most modern cameras will do that. 
Now we know that if you have a stabilization, whether on the lens or in the camera and the sensor, that can really help with getting sharp, longer exposure images. And camera with IBIS, and you have cameras from Olympus, from Sony, from Canon that have IBIS or a stabilization on the sensor. And they give you five, six, seven, eight tops or stabilizations. Camera with IBIS is highly recommended. So full frame or a small sensor camera. Well, usually the advantage goes to full frame cameras that are gonna have bigger pixels. The bigger the pixel, the better the camera is gonna do in low light situations. What kind of lens? For me, a 24-105 in my full frame camera works the best. That lens I use 95% of the time. I was able to take a lot of images in the 24 to 30 millimeter range, but I was able to get up close up to 105 as well. Having a zoom like that one is really beneficial. You also have some opportunities to take photos from more distant objects and doing close-ups. So I also had with me the RF 100 to 500 millimeter. Something in the 100 to 400, the 100 to 500 millimeter zoom will also be very good for that 5% of the cases where you want to get really up close and personal and do some close-ups. You also should bring a flash. I really recommend you bring a flash. It helps you open the shadows. Don't forget to bring a warming gel. The light in the caverns was upgraded. They have a big project that finished in 2017 and they put LED lighting throughout the cavern. The lighting is not very strong though. That's why having a flash to open the shadows is highly beneficial. But that light is a little on the warm side. It's probably around 3000 Kelvin. Having a warming gel will be really beneficial to blend the light or your flash with what is available in the cavern. For me, I didn't have a warming gel. But I was able in post-processing to adjust the lighting a bit and get some very nice results. Finally, how about tripod? I think you should bring a tripod, but be aware that tripods are not very practical. There are only a few areas. I remember some of those photos I showed you earlier. The pads tend to be a little narrow and there are only a few areas where you can put that tripod down and don't block the passage of other visitors. Have a light tripod with you, but don't expect to use it a lot. Now, it shouldn't be a surprise that inside the cavern is very dark. And when I say dark, it's dark. Yes, as I mentioned, there is lighting available on the main structures, but the lighting is not very strong. Make sure you're familiar with your equipment and how to optimize your camera for the best file that you can get for low light situations. One, shoot raw. We know raw files are gonna give you a lot more latitude and be able to save a lot more information than a JPEG file and gives you a lot more flexibility in post-processing. Second is when you set up your camera for raw, some cameras give you a choice for what type of file you'll be saving. A full raw file, like in my Canon R5 is almost 40 plus megabytes or a compressed raw file that is going to be about 20 megabytes in my case, but it may, it's going to throw away some of the information on the raw file. And in this case, I don't recommend you use any type of compression on the files that you're saving. Use the full raw file and get as much of the information. We're not going to be taking thousands of images. Okay. Just make sure you have a good card in your camera and save full size files. Next one is how many bits? You know, you see in the manual of your camera, whether well, your camera saves 12-bit files, so 13 or 14. My Canon R5 saves 14-bit files. That means it's two to the 14th power, the number of values that are used to represent the luminosity of each one of the pixels. But that can change, and it can be surprising. For example, in the Canon R5, if I switch from mechanical shutter to electronic shutter, it reduces from 14 to 12 bits. Nothing I can do about it. Also, if I'm using mechanical shutter and I put my camera on continuous high-speed shutter, it reduces from 14 bits to 13. Now, changing the number of bits from 14 to 13 or 12 doesn't make my camera less sensitive to the light. 
All it's doing is changing the number of values that are available in the file to represent the luminosity from the very darks, you know, the black, black, all the way to the white. And in this case, it's important to have as many bits as you can. Remember, you're going to have some parts that are well lit, where you're going to have highlights and you want to have detail there, but also you're going to be exposing a lot of dark area and you want to make sure even with flash that you give yourself a lot of latitude in the dark areas and what could happen if you're not saving enough bits on the file is there not going to be enough values to represent the dark or the very bright values in the file so when you open up the shadows in post or darken the highlights you may get banding in the photo the more bits the better. For me, my base settings using my Canon R5 with my Canon RF24105 lens, that gives me eight stops of stabilization. The combination of stabilization in the lens and the IBIS stabilization in the sensor in the camera. Those two work together in my Canon camera with eight stops of stabilization. I was able to take sharp images of half a second to a second in duration with no problem. Shooting manual exposure gives you the most control. And also you using flash, it also gives you the most latitude to make sure that whatever settings you have in the camera are consistent with what you're trying to do with the flash. Shooting the full raw file, mechanical shutter that gives me the full 14 bits. With flash, my settings were 1 15th of a second, F7.1, ISO 2300. I know my camera, I can go to ISO 5000, 6000 and be able to have low noise that I can easily fix in post. But I decided to keep it in the 2 to 3200 by going to a longer, upper, longer exposure, like 1 15th of a second. I could have gone to a bigger aperture, like f6.3 or 5.6, but I was concerned about depth of field so I wanted to stay at f7.1. You can probably shoot 6.3 or 5.6 without any problems as well. For those situations in which I had no flash, I went with longer exposure. So I typically was shooting 0 0.5, 0 0.6 seconds at f7.1 and ISO 3200, kind of in that range. Those were kind of my base exposures and then I adjusted from there up or down. The final recommendation is one to make sure don't blow the highlights. When you get your camera and you're looking, make sure you're exposing for the highlights. Don't blow the highlights. Don't trust the screen on the back of the camera. It's dark all around you and the screen is going to look very bright. So if you trust what you see on the screen, your images are going to be dark make sure you display the histogram and use the histogram to make sure you are exposing your image properly. Now, flash is your best friend. Doing off-camera flash, where we take our camera and we have the flash on the side, is not very practical, especially for structures that are not close to you and you're not using a tripod, so you don't have three or four arms to be able to hold everything. The majority of the time, or all the time, you're going to be using the flash on the hot shoe of the camera. And we want to have just enough light to open the shadows while avoiding that flash look that is very unnatural. Most flashes have TTL mode where the computer and the camera controls the flash to get the proper exposure. But I recommend you actually put the, the flash in manual and gives you a lot more flexibility on dialing the amount of light or amount of power that you need. You know, from one one, you know, full power, one half, one fourth, all the way in case of my flash to one twenty eighth power and steps in between. A lot of flexibility by going to manual. And finally, let's remember that in addition to controlling power, you can control zoom, you know, the little light element inside the flash moves in and out and that changes how spread the beam of the flash is. So you can get a very wide beam or you can get a very focused beam going forward. 
And the last control is you can adjust the angle of the head to try to illuminate different parts of the cavern. Let's give you an example. So here is, I did a test doing power level test. So I have my zoom fixed at 200 millimeters and I'm photographing this structure that looks like the head of a big monster. This rock is very large. This image right here, I'm at one quarter power and it had that flash look. The flash just overcomes the lighting that is available in the cavern from the LED lighting in the cavern. Then on this other one, I reduce the power of the flash by half. I went to one eight power and it starts to look more natural. On this other one, I went to one sixteen power. This is the one that gave me the best balance between the lighting that was already there in the cavern and the lighting provided by my flash. And here is my final image. I took the image I just showed you, 116 power, took the raw file, edited in Lightroom, adjusted my shadows, highlights, blacks, white balance, and here is my final edited image. Here's another example, but now I'm keeping the power fixed. All I'm doing is changing the zoom and looking at the effect of changing the zoom in the flash. So in this image, I have the zoom at 35 millimeters. What I don't like about this image is that it's lighting all the area around this hall. And what I really wanted was for the flash light to reach as far in as I could. So I changed the flash to 200 millimeters. And now you see less wasted light around the image and the area inside this part in the center now receive more light because now the beam of my flash is tighter. One thing I forgot to mention is that the rock that makes the cavern is very light in color. So it reflects a lot of the light. And that's one of the reasons why sometimes you can get away without having high power levels on the flash. And here is my final image. I took the one at 200 millimeters, took it to Lightroom as a raw file, and did my final edits, highlights, shadows, contrast, white balance, and so on. So here is the final resulting image taking a 200 millimeter flash zoom. So let's summarize what we discussed in flash. I use a Godox TT635C. If you're planning on buying a flash, you don't have one, I highly recommend you look into Godox flashes. I think they provide great value for the money and I'm not a sponsor by Godox. I now have four of these flashes for my Hummingbird multi-flash setup all fired by the same controller. Use the flash in manual mode, first exposing your camera for the highlights using your histogram, and then dial enough flash, power, and zoom to open the shadows. And don't forget, you can adjust the tilt of the head as well to get uh, the effect that you want. Take a warming gel with you to better match the temperatures of the available LED lighting in the cavern. And here are some examples for what ended up working for me after I went through my notes and I want to share with you. Four structures that were relative close to me, a few feet away, a couple of meters away. I end up using 132nd to 164 power and a zoom as wide as it could get in the neighborhood of 24 to 30 millimeters. For things that were a little more distance, and I commit, maybe things that were 15 to 30 feet away, five to 10 meters away, I would use 116 power to 132nd power, and then adjusted the zoom to be in the 70 to 100 millimeter range. And finally, for structures that were a little bit farther, I wanted to be able to reach maybe to the other side of the cave, I was using a quarter to eight power and the zoom at 200. This would change on the camera that you have and ISO and aperture, of course. Now, if you don't have flash, as I told you, you can get still good exposures with the available lighting, but you have to remember it's very dark out there. You're gonna end up taking either very high ISO images 
or very long exposure. Here is this example. Here, these two images were taken at 0.6 second exposure, F71 ISO 2000. I have IBIS and the first image was not sharp. The second image was. Use good technique, right? Get your elbows in, control your breathing, don't Press too hard on the shutter, roll your finger on the shutter, all the things that you know how to use. Another thing you can do is use the two second timer where you're holding your camera, press the shutter, control your breathing, and in two seconds the shutter will get activated and the image will be taken. And basically you're getting rid of the vibration introduced by pressing the shutter. Another method is continuous shooting. I had my camera on low speed continuous shooting, which is I think three or four uh, frames a second. It still gave me the full 14 bits and one press of the shutter, hold the shutter, and will take you know two or three images for as long as the shutter is pressed. And this is what I did in this situation, right? So I was holding my camera, I pressed the shutter, took the first image, took the second image, I let go of the shutter. And no surprise, the second image is a lot sharper and is very sharp compared to the first image. These are the raw files and edited files. You can also increase the ISO, but you have to go to very high ISOs. Let's look at the settings of these two images I'm showing you. I'm at 0.6 seconds. So if I wanted to go to 1 30th of a second, that's four stops. I had to compensate by either opening my aperture increasing my ISO or a combination of both. You can also experiment with HDR and this is what I did here. This is the structure called the Dolls Theater and has a lot of detail. I was able to use the tripod in this case. So let's look at this first image. The image is exposed for the center part of the structure and even at 140 of a second F8 ISO 4000 this column right here is blown. The LED lighting inside this cavity was too close to that column and there was just in any detail. So I decided to experiment with HDR. So I went plus minus two stops. This is my base image. Here's the second image at minus two stops. Now this area here still looks fairly bright on minus two stops, but there is enough detail. I was able to recover all the detail that I wanted in that column. Here's the one at plus two stops. And here is the final edited image, merging all three in Lightroom and then doing my final edits. I like this image. It's one of my favorite images. I have a lot of detail in the main part, in the center part. I like the lighting effect around it, and then I like the darkness on the edges of the image. In this case, HDR was the solution for this type of situation. Finally, amigos, I hope you like this set of recommendations for Carlsbad. It's a very unique opportunity. I highly recommend to you to visit Carlsbad. There may be caverns in the area that you live, so maybe go visit some of those as well because some of the lessons learned I share with you and the recommendations will work for you as well in those situations. I hope you like these videos. Please, if you like, don't forget to subscribe, send me a comment or two, tell a friend about this channel, and I'll see you next time.